Hi everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Venetia and this is the Woolly Worker Knitting Podcast. So this is episode number four. I'm so excited to be filming today and to share what I've been up to in the last couple of weeks. It's been two weeks since I last filmed and the last couple of times it actually was a three week break between episodes but um, I wanted to announce the giveaway winners in this episode. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, in the previous episode to celebrate my 1000 subscriber milestone, I organized a giveaway where I would be giving a free pattern of someone's choice. And I'm excited to give the name of the winner of that giveaway. I'm also excited because I am wearing a finished object that I am so, so, so excited about and looking forward to speaking about. It was a bit of a slog, but we got there in the end. We've got a few other finished objects, we got some works in progress, and then I'm gonna do a category in this episode called the um, false starts, and I'm gonna share with you the projects that I'm gonna frog that uh, just didn't work out for a reason or another, just I guess to show the times where things don't really go as planned, as opposed to the times that everything works out smoothly, and also to give me a bit of motivation to actually frog them and start over because sometimes you need a bit of distance from those projects when you painstakingly worked on them and it was all for nothing. So grab yourself some knitting and as always, if you wanna let me know in the comments what you're working on while watching this, it's always really nice to hear that you're knitting along watching my podcast. It's kind of the goal, I guess, is to keep you company while you knit because I love watching podcasts while I knit. As always, all the information about all of the projects that I mention or people or websites, I will link that below in the description. I keep it very, very detailed with the color, uh, with the name of the colors. Yeah, I try to, I try to keep it very detailed. And then, if you want, you can also follow me on Ravelry at the Woolly Worker or on Instagram at the Woolly Worker. I try and be active on both of those platforms and it's really nice to connect on those. You can always send me a message on Instagram. I, I really, really love when that happens. So I'll announce the giveaway winner at the end of the video and then I will also open up the comment box for a Q&A. I thought it could be maybe nice to do that in the next episode. So if you have any questions that you want to ask me, I guess knitting related or otherwise, you can pop it below in the comments and I will also host a comment box on Instagram closer to the time and then I will select some questions if there are any to answer in the next episode so please leave a question uh, I'm a bit nervous doing this in case no one else really cares but it could be fun to uh, I guess get to know me a little better but uh, if this is your first time watching then like I said my name is Venetia I am a knitter and I guess podcaster based in central Scotland just around Edinburgh I'm originally from Belgium but I moved here to study uh, eight years ago and I've loved it ever since. I don't have plans of coming back to Belgium. Sorry, mom. And yeah, I live with my partner, which I will talk about in this episode because I've knitted him some socks and I, I love knitting. So let's get into it today. So the first thing I will talk about is this finished object. And you may recognize this with the sleeves and the neck. This is the balloon sweater by Petite Knit. So I will try and show this a bit better. Yeah, you can see the full effect of the balloon sleeve. You've got a lot of give in that. This is made with Filcolana Arueta in marzipan and Filcolana Tilia in Snow White. Held together, knit on four millimeter needles for the body and then I think three millimeter for all the ribbing. So I'll share the length I made it. I made it a little bit longer than what the pattern called for. All of my modifications will be on Ravelry and thoughts about the pattern and everything as I was knitting it. I also made the sleeves longer. I made that part of the sleeve around five centimeters longer and then I did the 10 centimeters of ribbing that the pattern called for. And those suggestions were taken from Ravelry projects of other people where they had mentioned that the body was quite cropped and that the sleeves were not balloony enough, I guess. So this was a very slow knit, I guess, compared to my other knits. This took about a month. I finished it a couple days ago and it was just on the blocking mats this morning, but it's finally dry and I was really looking forward to finishing, to having it blocked to wear in this episode. There's also a nice little shoulder detail, but I'll insert B-roll footage once I go and film with my boyfriend to show you the full effect of the jumper. It is quite warm actually, so if I take this off midway, that might happen. So 
I've talked about this in the previous couple of episodes, but yeah, I found it quite slow. You have to do some German short rows at the front while you're doing also the raglan. No, there's no raglan. Yes, there are some raglan. In, well, there's the shoulder increases that you're doing with make one left and make one right. And you're also doing short rows. And all of that is done flat. And then you also do the front panel flat and then the back panel flat. Then you join in the round at the underarm and you finish knitting the body and then you knit the ribbing. Then you pick up stitches for the sleeve, like a classic drop shoulder, and then you knit all of the sleeve, and then you knit the ribbing, and I did tubular bind off on everything. This was the tubular cast on as well. And in the other episode I mentioned that I wasn't super happy with the look of my German short rows, and I think it's okay now. I don't really mind. I think it does look symmetrical in the end, and the blocking kind of smooth everything out. Some very helpful people commented that maybe next time I could do Japanese short rows, I've done those in my sycamore sweater, which I've talked about in my first episode. And if I were to remake this balloon jumper, that's a suggestion I could definitely take into account because the Japanese short rows are relatively easy. I think you can substitute them like for like with the German short rows, which you can do with the wrap and turn. You have to do a bit of math to adjust that if you're to replace one for the other. So yeah, I found it slow when you were doing it flat. And then I thought that once I would join the body in the round and do the sleeves, it would be much faster because it would be stuck in it in the round. But I actually found the sleeves to be pretty slow going as well. But then at some point I tried it on and I could finally fully take the balloon and drop shoulder effect of the jumper, even though the sleeves weren't finished. And I was obsessed with it. I was, I, I just needed that jumper to be done so I could try it. and and wear it. Uh, I don't know when I'm gonna wear this. I haven't worn it out, I guess, yet. Maybe a date night would be cute. Um, so yeah, once I got that motivation back, then I was working much faster, and then I just kept track of how many rows I did on one sleeve, finished that sleeve, did the other one. I guess something that I should mention with that is that I was playing a yarn chicken at some point, because I made the size extra small, and I had, I think... Hmm, let me check. Yeah, I had five balls of Tilia and five balls of uh, Arweta. And I realized I was probably going to run out of Arweta. And I was a bit annoyed at that because I was bragging in the last episode at how good I am at estimating yardages and never having too much extra yarn and always winning yarn chicken. And then this time I thought, oh no, I'm going to lose it. And then halfway through the second sleeve, I actually realized that I had an extra ball of Arweta in marzipan that I had bought for a completely different project for a pair of socks. So I thought that's amazing because worst case scenario I can take some of that yarn. So I just had it on my desk ready to be used if needed. And in the end I didn't even need that. Actually I think I saved my tail. This is what I had left of yarn. So you can see just that's yarn chicken. That's what I had left after doing the ribbing of the body. So I really could not even have done one more round. And I'm happy I didn't do one less round. So I'm really happy that I was able to use as much of this yarn as possible to make the body and the sleeves as long as I wanted them to be. And now I've just got half a ball left of the mohair for Tilia, which it's why it's mohair. I'm sure that'll be very handy for maybe a hat or a headband or for swatching if I don't want to swatch with uh, Tilia balls that uh, I'm scared of running out of. So the fit is great. I did the size extra small and as you can see there's quite a bit of give. Uh, I blocked it. I didn't pin it or anything. I just laid it flat to dry, smoothed everything out and I'm really happy with how big everything is. I'm happy I didn't go for the small size because I think it would have just been a bit maybe too oversized but I think this still gives that oversized effect that the photos show uh, on the model. I don't know if I would do this again because I feel like one might just be enough in the wardrobe. I don't think I need two of these. But if I were to do it again, like I said, I could maybe make one in a rusty color or maybe a baby blue or something like that. Something just like light and airy. I love the fabric that this gives. It's super airy and flowy. It drapes beautifully. I like that drop shoulder kind of shadow that it creates when you picked up for the sleeves. I obviously love the shoulder. Um, detail like that. I think it's so elegant and professional and polished. This is a beautiful piece of knitwear. I think the pattern is written really well. I think it has a bit of a difficulty, like difficult rating, 
But if you've made a few jumpers and you've tried on a few of those techniques in other jumpers, then you shouldn't have any problems putting it all together. So I'd say go for it. It's really rewarding. So the next finished object that I have, I also showed in the podcast in the last episode, and this is a turny sleepover by Sophie from the Knit Pearl Girl. And I'll show it here on a coat hanger. Um, so that's it in all its glory. I still need to weave in an end, but this has been blocked. It really changes a lot in the blocking because firstly, this is alpaca. And secondly, there's a bit of a knit pearl structure and texture. I mean, so it's quite elastic and bouncy and it stretches width wise and lengthwise. This is made with scentless garn alpaca in the color grayish, but I'll put the number of the color on Ravelry and in the description if you want to um, have a look because it's quite a nice color. I like it. It's a bit darker than this, for example, so it's like a nice light slash medium tint. Um, I'm gonna say I'm not the biggest fan of this project. I'm not the happiest with it. I think the fit is great, although Having said that, I think the armholes are a bit too long for me. I think this is a bit too low on my body. And also, I actually was playing yarn chicken and I ran out of yarn. So here you can see on the body, the ribbing at the bottom starts off a bit too early. I wish I had some stockinet sections after this last bit of knit pearl. I don't know if that makes sense, but I just, I ran out of yarn, so I couldn't do that. But I'm happy with being able to have, you know, done the ribbing without running out, because that would have been annoying. And the other problem with this is that it barely fits over my head. I didn't even try it on until I was finished. And when I tried it on after blocking, I realized I really have to force it. Once it's on, it's on and it's fine. And I can also take it off, but I have to force, which is not nice. And I think this is going to cause me to be less likely to wear this, to reach for it. I'll reach for other sleepovers that don't have that problem. And I think the problem I have with this and it's completely my fault, I guess, is I guess I'm not that big a fan of that texture. I just, I thought it looked nice. And then once I had it on, I realized maybe I just would have preferred a stockinette fabric for that slipover. The sweater number 18 or 19 by My Favorite Things Knitwear is also known to have that knit pearl structure. And I thought I would really like that sweater, but now I'm considering not knitting that one because I don't know that I like that texture after all. The pattern is really nice and detailed. It gives you charts for every different size. It's got lots of little advice and tips. And if you're a complete, complete beginner, it also tells you which parts you can make simpler for yourself, but it encourages you to try and attempt to do them. For example, German short rows for the shoulder shaping. And for the neck edge, I think what I should have done was to, uh, I think what the pattern says is that you knit the neck, bind off, and then you sew it on afterwards. But what I do for all my neck edges, whenever I'm doing a double folded neck, is that after I'm done, I don't bind off, but I fold it and I knit the last row together with the bind on, like the cast on row. Uh, and I use a video that Petite Net had done for the Marseille sweater, but I found that to work for most of the sweaters I've done that way. It's just a shame that for this one it was a bit too tight. Uh, what I could do differently is I could go up one needle size to do the neck bind off. And also for this entire sweater, I did it with the Sennes Garn Alpaca and I had to go down the needle size for everything. Maybe next time I should go down the needle size for the main body, but keep the needle size that the pattern recommends for the ribbing and the bind off. But who knows? So I don't think I would make this pattern again because I don't think I like the finished garment that much. It doesn't bring as much joy as this does, for example. But I don't regret making it. It was good fun. It was quite fast as well. As always, slipovers are just so good to do in between projects, I find, personally. The thing as well with this yarn, actually, is that in a couple of the kinds of yarn, so the yarn is plied, I guess. Maybe it has two or three plies. And sometimes I would be coming up to my working yarn and two or one of the plies would be like broken and so the yarn would be literally holding by one thread only which made it very it seemed precarious and i wasn't really confident keeping on working with that in case it broke so i would have to then unpick the last five or six stitches to leave myself a tail cut the bit where it was only holding on by a single thread then join the new yarn like the the new end that would be 
more secure and strong. So that left me with a lot of ends to weave in, which was very annoying, but it's okay. Uh, now I barely even remember having to do that. I just remember making a note of that in case you get this yarn. It's kind of, it's my first time coming across this problem. Usually the only problem I have with skeins of yarn is that there's knots in them, which is fine, but I've never come across yarn that was almost broken. So I used five skeins of yarn. So if you wanted to make yours longer, you could buy six and then you would be able to end at the place that the pattern calls to end instead of what I had to do and crop it a little bit. Or if you wanted to um, only buy five skeins of alpaca, then you could purposely end like one repetition earlier as opposed to me who tried to go for as long as I could. It was a little hard to block as well because of how unpredictable it is. I did my gauge swatch and I had my swatch measurements knowing that it would grow but I guess you didn't really know exactly how much it would grow and the pattern gives you the circumference that it's supposed to have and the depth of the armholes and everything but it was kind of hard to stretch it out on the blocking mats and have it stay that way and you know if you're stretching it lengthwise then it like reduces widthwise then you have to like go back to the width etc so this was not the most enjoyable knit but it's okay you don't have to absolutely adore all of your projects that'd be pretty unrealistic so I'm just happy that it's done. I'm sure I will wear it. It'll look good over shirts and over t-shirts. And I like working with alpaca. The yarn was very like buttery and smooth and really nice to work with, very bouncy. So the next uh, project I showed on my Instagram story and I also showed one of them in um, my video about everything I knit last year. So this is the first one I had done in November last year and I finally got around to making the second one and those are the wrist warmers from the book Knitting from Fair Isle and it's a pattern. It's a book by Matty Ventrelin. I've done a lot of patterns from this book and Those are the wrist warmers. So this is done with Jameson Shetland Spin Rift Heritage in a, an array of colors that uh, were left over from a hat I had made from that book as well. So I won't try them on right now because I already have my balloon sleeves, but I'll show some footage of me wearing them. I think they're quite long. I don't know how practical these are going to be. I also have little cuffs in that same yarn that I actually reach for all the time and I just keep them in my coat pocket and those are quite nice. I think these are going to be much warmer because they're going to go much higher up my like arm, up to my elbow. I think it could be nice if I'm wearing something with big gaping sleeves aka the opposite of this. This under a coat would be perfect because it would keep my skin insulated. But these would be nice in case I'm not wearing a balloon jumper. The other thing I'm not really happy with with this project is how bright the yellow is. And I followed the color recommendations that the book calls for. And usually I really liked that book's recommendation and I loved the color palettes that it was offering, but this just doesn't work for me. It's, it's just the orange screams at you. Pretty happy with how symmetrical they are. It's also a very interesting technique at the beginning here, at the top and at the end, where even though the, these are stripes and there's not really color work involved, you actually do color work. So you're holding two strands of the light blue in the light blue section, and you're alternating which strand you're picking to make your stitch. So what it does is that it gives you floats for that stripe section, which First prevents it from rolling too much. I mean, this is stockinette basically, but there's barely any roll. And then the other thing is that it gives you the same gauge as if you were using color work. And it also doubles as a warmth layer, the same way that color work floats do behind your work. So I thought that was a pretty clever detail and something that I could steal in the future. I like the Fair Isle motif. I was happy to practice it. Also the thing that I was really kicking myself for was that it took a day to make the second one. So I really had no excuse and when I'm making pairs of things, I really, really, really need to force myself to make them like one after the other to avoid that kind of problem. But yeah, I block them by putting them on mitten, like mitt blockers, which aren't straight, like they're a bit curved, but these have blocked to be pretty straight. So I'm, I'm happy with that. They look very nice. Like I said, the color I'm not super happy with. The book always has three colorways for projects. So technically I could remake these with a different colorway like the classic Shetland Fair Isle colors that are, um, you know, blue, red, yellow, black and white. But I don't think I need two pairs of these, although they could be a great gift. So maybe someone in my life is gonna receive these for Christmas. Sorry if you're watching this video and it's you, or you're welcome, I guess, I don't know. So 
Then I was on a kick to keep making things with this book and to do Fair Isle. I will talk about something in a next video, but one of my goals for this year is to knit something by Mary Wallen, and it's very daunting and intimidating, so I thought I'd practice my Fair Isle. So a few days ago, I decided to make another ski hat. So the pattern name is called the Ski Hat by Matty Ventrelin. And the one I made last year was this one in the classic Fair Isle colors that I just mentioned. And I showed this in my previous video with, with everything I've, I've made last year. So I like it. I think it was a bit too big at the top. Like there was a bit too much, but I think it's quite nice. I like the colors. I like the color work on this. I think it's very neat and flat. It's just really nice and professional. This one has been blocked and it's just very crisp looking. It's a double, like double brim. So you need a lot of ribbing at the beginning on very small needles. It's like a slog, but then you get to the color work and it's very addictive because you're just doing one stripe after the other. So I always knew in my heart I was gonna remake that one because I, I loved another colorway that the book was suggesting with those colors. So this is an olive color that I really liked and then a rust red color and then some greys. This one here at the top is called Shetland Black and as you can see it's kind of very dark brown. So I had the yarn in my stash, I knew the whole time what it was destined for and then I finally cast it on and here it is now. And I've just finished this this morning so I just had the little top to do. Uh, I would have finished it last night but my hands were starting to hurt and I told myself don't give yourself an injury by wanting to finish something a few hours like earlier. So the brim is made in the olive color and then you've got all those nice little bands and stripes. The red as an accent color is just stunning. And then the top of it is made with the Shetland black color. And I've made that one on smaller needles than the other one. So the first one that I showed, I made in 2.75 millimeter needles. And that one is made on 2.5 for the main body. And I also removed a couple of rows from the top, but I don't know if that made such a big difference. So I'll try it on. And I really like it. I think olive goes great with my blonde hair. And I haven't blocked this one yet because it's just been finished, but I think it'll help as well with kind of smoothing everything out and getting the color work to be really flat. I'm really proud of my floats for this. They're, they're nice and even and stretchy. I still think it's a bit too big in the sense like that there's too much fabric at the top but I don't think this is going to bother me. The other hats I've shown in, in that video from last year they're way too long and I never wear them but this is definitely a practical hat that I can see myself wearing. The pattern suggests that you sew on a pom-pom or a tassel at the top and actually I do have some pom-poms so I might sew one on although I really really like it without. And the interesting thing I learned with this is a technique for your floats uh, no, for your ends, because it's Fair Isle, there's a lot of color changing, so there's going to be a lot of ends to weave in, like all the beginning ones and all the ending ones. And initially, what I wanted to do is that there's a technique where it's like weave in as you go, and it's like when you're starting a new color, they suggest that you, before you finish your row, you're already starting to weave in the end of the color that you haven't added in yet, and then when you add that new color at the beginning of the row, you start to weave in the end of the color that you've just dropped. And that would be fair enough if the colors were just like, if the rows only had one color, but when there's fair isle involved and you already have to follow the chart about whether you're, you, you know, using the yarn from the right or the left, or like you're black or you're white or whatever, I find it really hard to think about weaving something in and out at the same time. I thought there was, there was no way. But another technique that, exists for floats is for ends is that you can carry them up rounds so for example here the khaki the olive you end here but then just a couple bends above you're picking the khaki back up so i thought there's no point in me ending the khaki if i'm going to use it in what like 10 rows and it's tiny knitting as well so 10 rows is what like an inch at best and I'll put a link to the video that I followed in the description and also on my Ravelry. I haven't woven in the ends because I wanted to show you. So I'll put all the ends aside, but basically, because I, I didn't do it for every end because some of the ends, like the red, like it was just a bit too much. And also I didn't want to carry up six balls of yarn up at once. Otherwise I'd get a very bulky seam. 
But what you can hopefully see is this uh, column here. Um, like that line here. Those are my ends that I'm carrying. And usually what I was doing was I was carrying the background color. So khaki, gray and black I was carrying up. And then the red I was just cutting and the white I was cutting. You can see that. So I thought that was pretty clever. The reason that you have you have to twist them and catch them as you go, otherwise you're gonna get very gaping loops, which don't matter too too much for a hat or a cowl or tubes, but it would matter for socks or mitts in case your toes and fingers got caught in those loops. But it's just good practice, I guess. And I was only catching them every like five or six rows. I wasn't even counting. It was just like when I noticed that those uh, working yarns were quite far down in the hat, then I would pull them back up, twist my working yarn, and then put them aside again. It made me have to be a bit more careful with my yarn management and where I was holding the bo the bobbins or like the, the skines. I was keeping my working yarn that I was using in the rows, you know, like in front of me. And I was using the yarns I wasn't using. I was placing them quite far away on my desk. But this was not a portable project that had to be on my desk the whole time. But I'm really, really happy with it. I love the colors. It's just, it's so nice and muted. I would want to make more patterns in that colorway from the book. But my biggest problem with this is that the chart is wrong in the book. The chart gives you the legend for the colors, but that doesn't match the chart that has like the color work pattern. So I had to do a bit of figuring out and reverse engineer from the photos of the book. And if you are doing this and you want me to tell you what I did, then you can ask me and I can tell you. But basically, whenever there's like the lime color in the chart, I replaced that with olive. And then the olive color in the chart, I replaced with the gray. And I think that gives me a really good colorway motif. But the book also has a pattern for a cowl or a sweater or a sweater vest, you know, using those colors. And the charts also seem wrong. There's just something that doesn't work out with that. Uh, colorway and it's upsetting because you'd think that they would either republish it right or post a statement or an errata but there's nothing and I even tried to reach the designer by email a couple of times and I never he heard back so that's disappointing and I felt confident changing that chart for the hat even though it took me ages to get around to doing that because I was nervous about doing it wrong and having a final product I wouldn't be happy with but I wouldn't be confident doing this with the sweater pattern, which is a shame because a sweater in those colors, Fair Isle, I would absolutely wear like every day. I think that would be amazing. But maybe I'll just find a different Fair Isle motif that has six colors and I'll plug those six colors in. I could see that happening. So yeah, really, really happy with this hat. I can't wait to wear it. I'm going to block it uh, after I film this video. I just couldn't wait to show you. So the next finished item is going to be the socks that I was doing for my boyfriend. So I talked about these in the previous episode. There's no pattern I followed for that. I just kind of did all the things I had learned from the previous socks I was making. So they're just kind of vanilla socks, 64 stitches for a certain amount on the leg and a certain amount on the foot with a classic slip stitch, heel, flap and gusset and a classic toe. So I just had to steal these from him. Um, before I started filming, he was wearing them, so they're still warm. <laughs> but these are the socks and they look gorgeous. I did a really good job, I think, at matching the stripes. As you can see, they start at the same brown and then they end at the same brown. Like, I think it's amazing. He loves them, they fit him really well. If anything, I'm a bit worried about the toe because it's not that it's see-through, but you could see that his toe maybe like wants to peek out a little bit, which means that it would be on the smaller size side. But it, he said he would rather that than, than they were on the bigger side. And he likes his socks to be really fitted. So yeah, so we're just gonna see if they break and if I need to mend them. But yeah, I think if I were to make him socks again, I would follow the exact same steps that I did for this. I remember when making the second sock, I was trying to do it as fast as I could after finishing the first one. So I would keep the same tension and everything. I remember they were like just... I think when I was trying to follow the rounds that I had set myself out to do, I would end at a different color. 
So I just made a couple more rounds or a couple less rounds. And I was just, you know, it's fine. They really, they really don't have to be symmetrical in the number of rounds. They just have to be symmetrical in look, I thought. So I can't even remember which sock has more rows than the other. And I'm really happy with how they turned out. I gifted these to him for Valentine's Day and he was so happy and he's been wearing them almost every day since, which makes me so, so, so happy. If you've never made socks for someone, uh, please do it because seeing them on like their feet as they're just like casually lounging in the house is just so, so, so nice and kind of weird actually to see your knitted items on other people. It's, it's a really, really great feeling. But yeah, he was very happy with them and if I haven't already, I'll put a bit of uh, footage of him modeling them for me. But yeah, he's been really uh, worthy of that gift and I will definitely knit him more socks in the future. And now that I know his perfect recipe, I know that I can make some of them in secret as a surprise and I don't need him to try them on because I already know what it's like. Okay, so that's it for all my finished projects. So the balloon sweater was definitely the big one and then all the rest were like accessories, which were quite fast. Um, the next section is going to be works in progress and I'll start with the one that you've already seen. It's the Lento sweater from Line magazine and that one, to be completely honest, I'm not enjoying super much. I lost interest and motivation. It's just not exciting, I guess. Uh, I have other projects that I'm doing or that I'm wanting to do that just capture my attention more. So I'll try and show. I think last time I was just about to split for sleeves. So now I've split for sleeves, done a bit of the body and done a bit of the sleeve. Actually, the sleeve was mostly done this morning because it is actually, to be fair, working out really fast. Um, so yeah, the colors I've mentioned before, I went for a bit of a wild card here. I chose this hazelnut rusty color in Drops Alpaca and then uh, Drops Brushed Alpaca in gray for the kind of second strand and I'm really happy with it. I'm doing this on 5.5 millimeter needles instead of six because I gauge swatched and that's what I thought I should do. Doing the extra small ver version and for the raglans as well, the pattern has you do uh, like mm, knit front back or something, but I prefer the look of make one left and make one right. So I did a bit of math to figure out how to adapt it for that. And I think I did a bit of mistakes as well, where I'm one stitch off in one of the areas, but then I, I think the sleeves had one less. The sleeves, I can't remember if the sleeves had one less or one more stitch than they should. So when it was time to split them, then I just decreased or increased at that time. So I'm really taking it easy. I'm not making this perfect by no means. And I'm also worried about running out of yarn for this. I think I will if I make this how I wanted it to be. One thing that stopped me as well was that I, I couldn't decide what to do for the sleeve. The original has like a, a tapered sleeve that ends at three quarter length and I knew I didn't want that. I was initially thinking of doing a balloon sleeve because I was in a balloon sleeve mood with this and then the eclair um, pullover from before but I also maybe thought it could be nice to do like a just a wide sleeve that has no decreases and it's just like very gapy at the end and I thought that could be nice but the problem with those is that they use more yarn and a lot as opposed to if I was making decreases and then now I'm thinking that maybe what I want and also would be easier especially to gauge like how much yarn to use because for the ribbing you have to estimate beforehand how much ribbing you're going to do but I think I'm going to keep making that sleeve and there's no decreases so far. I'm going to keep making it for, I think, 16 inches and then I'm going to do an I-cord bind off and I'll do that on the other sleeve and make an I-cord bind off. Then I'll see how much yarn I have left and then do the body. And then once I'm happy with the body length, either I-cord bind off for that or like one or two inches of ribbing. And my only regret doing that would be that I didn't do the neck as an I-cord. I think it'll be fine, but it would have looked more cohesive if everything was an I-cord. But I'm kind of excited to do I-cord sleeves because it's a modification that I might want to do for sweaters, but never did because I, I've never done it. So I don't know what it looks like or feels like in real time, in real life. I've seen it on other people's projects and I love the look of it, but I don't know if it would be for me. This is kind of my trial and error pr project that I don't care about or have big feelings about. So if I do the I-cord edging on everything, except the neck and I don't like it, then it's fine. I think this is just going to be a very comfy sweater. 
and just like I said, the trial and error and anything that I don't like from this or like from this, I can take on feedback and when I make my second one, adapt. And there will be a second one because this is a really good pattern for hand dyed skinds of yarn that don't break the bank. And I've got two skinds of hand dyed yarn. I was speaking about that in the latest podcast actually, how I wanted to make one with the colorway um, Misery, which is inspired by the Stephen King book Misery. This is a yarn from Helen at Giddy Yarns. She also has a podcast and I'll link her below. And I'll just show you quickly, not while I'm talking about this because it's relevant. But yeah, this is the yarn that I bought from her. Uh, it's a sock yarn, so it has nylon, but that's fine. And I think those two skinds should give me a good length like sweater. Maybe not the same sleeves though. I might have to taper these, but I really, really like it. I think it's gorgeous. I think it looks exactly like the photo that she has on her website. She has a couple, I think there's six skinds in the collection for Stephen King. Uh, it was kind of hard to choose, but my favorite book of Stephen King is Misery and I like blue, so I went for this one. A bit of blood red on it. I think it's great. So I think I'll make another lento with this. That's the plan, but not anytime soon because I'm really bored of this lento. I don't love it. By the way, this is part of a knit along uh, organized by Amy Palco and the Crea Bea that they're running until the 5th of March, I think. And yeah, it was my first time participating in the knit along and I was excited and like all the hype, but then I don't, love the project anymore and it feels like a slog and I just have to do it. Oh actually one more thing, one more modification that I did with this sweater, again just a, a little trial of a design element, I've added a faux seam to it. Uh, so I'm doing this on the side like just right under the arm and I'm also doing it under the sleeve and I've just added a single pearl stitch to break up the front and the back. So I'll try and show it, maybe on the sleeve. Well, I don't think you're gonna see, but this is, yeah, that's the beginning of the round. And as you can see, there's a bit of a ridge. That's my pearl faux seam. So yeah, just there. And it's really easy to do. And you just, like, I just put a couple of stitch markers just to remember between those two stitch markers, I've got to do a pearl stitch and it's like, quite stretchy. So I just thought I'd try that because I've seen some people do that on other sweaters. And again, I wanted to try it without committing to a project that I cared about too much. So yeah, just realizing this morning how fast the sleeve is knitting up, I probably should just power through with it and finish it because I want to clear my needles off of the sweaters so that I can start making other sweaters because I've got lots of plans, as you can probably tell from all my videos. and. I want to fill my needles with things that bring me joy and excitement and this lento is not doing that right now. Okay, the next work in progress, I think I had shown a swatch in the last episode and it's a test knit for Hyris Makes and it's a cabled vest. It's my first project doing cables that I'm not giving up on. I had started a, a sweater but I hated it and that was two years ago. And this has worked up incredibly fast. The deadline is in like July so there's no rush at all. I'm using the Fiberco Lore for yarn. It's a woolen spun yarn in a gorgeous kind of denim-ish color that I really like. I didn't want it to be beige cables because I want to save that for a big beige cable iron sweater. I think they'll look great and I don't want to have things that look too similar. So, so far I've done this. So I've done the entire back panel and then I've done the two fronts and I've joined the two fronts and done a little bit, like just a tiny bit after the underarm. So I think the plan is going to be to finish this ball of yarn for as long as I can for the body, then pick up and do the neck and the armhole rib and then finish the body. There's two options in the pattern, one cropped, one not cropped. I think I'll do the cropped one, but I've got enough yarn to make uh, either. It's gonna be very stretchy because it's cables. I'm really happy with the look of my cables. I'll show the back. Yeah, I think it's really nice. It'll look better once it has the, um, the ribbing, but I think it's a nice color. I think it was nice. It's going up really fast and I know I don't have sleeves to make. It's really addictive. Like I just can't stop knitting because the cables have this big like diamond, you know, which is kind of one big section and you just kind of want to reach the end of the diamond. And before you know it, you've done almost half a diamond already. So you want to finish that diamond. And there's not that many diamonds at the front, so it really will be 
fast to finish. And like I said, it's not urgent, so it's not always the thing I reach for. But if this was my only project, I'm sure I would finish it so, so fast because it, it's so addictive. And the yarn is an absolute pleasure to work with. I'm baffled at how amazing it feels. It is a bit pricey, so it's a shame, but it's got a lot of yardage because it's wool and spun, so it's very light. And I think it's, um, I want to say it's a hundred grams kind. This kind was huge next to my face. So for cables, I think it works beautifully as well. It really shows them off and defines them. So maybe I'd want to make another cabled like jumper or vest using that yarn if I decide to spend that money, because I'm sure there's other yarns that are really nice for cables. But I'm, I'm just so surprised at how much I love this and how fun it's been. So that project is a total win. I, uh, I'll see if I have more to show in the next podcast. I don't know if I'm going to be picking this up too, too much. The next project is another test knit, and that's for the lovely Anna from Along Avec Anna. You might know her for her designs, or you might know her for her yarn. She has a beautiful selection of amazing colors. She's got merino, double merino, and soft silk mohair, and the soft silk mohair is completely cruelty-free, even the silk core. And I went with the color Celadon for both the yarn and the mohair. As you can see, it's that kind of beautiful, like, grayish, bluish, turquoise. Um, it's not showing up exactly like this on, on, like in real life compared to camera, but that's fine. I'll show some pictures or footage if needed. And I've not done much yet, I guess. Oh, no. Oh, I think there's a bit of... There's a stain on it from something. I must have placed it on Ooh, a wet surface or something. Oh dear. This is why I need project bags. I started this project while I had to go on a big train journey one day. I had like about four hours of train, so I decided to cast on the beginning of the Primrose slipover the night before. So I'd have all my stitches and then I knew it was just talking it for ages. So I wouldn't even need to bring a measuring tape because I probably wouldn't be reaching that point anyway. And it was a very enjoyable train knit. I felt really cool knitting with my two little balls of yarn. You know, there wasn't that many people in the train, but it was very peaceful and quiet and enjoyable. But I'll try and show what I've got so far. It's a little tricky because it's stocking it, so it's rolling up. But <laughs> here's what I've got. But it's, it's longer in, in real life. I'll unroll it like a sc scroll. That's it. So it literally is just stocking it here. And this is for the back panel. And this is a slipover. Well, it will be a slipover called the Primrose slipover. So yeah, I love the color. I was hesitating between this and Royal. I think I mentioned in the previous podcast, but I'm glad I went for this. I think this is more wearable. And... Yeah, I guess the stocking net is a bit of a slog, there's nothing much happening, you have to do that for quite a while. But then at some point, I think when I finish those uh, skines that are attached to it, I'll be picking up for the right front and the left front, and then I'll join them, and I think they'll add a bit of excitement. There's been some things that people have pointed out about the pattern, people who like have worked up faster than I have. And so they mentioned things to Anna, and Anna is going to soon give us a new version of the pattern. So I'm kind of waiting for that to happen before I go any further, just in case there are mistakes. Which is interesting when you're doing a test net, is um, that there might be mistakes in the, the, the pattern. So you must, I guess, be okay with frogging or waiting. And I'm not the best with accepting I need to frog something. Usually I prefer not to, I guess. So yeah, I'm... I'm happy with this yarn. It's really nice and soft. I couldn't meet gauge with the needles that were recommended. I think the recommended was four millimeters, so I went down to 3.75. And at first I thought I was going to have to go down to 3.5, which would be really dense. But then after blocking, it was fine, and I can use the 3.75. And again, if I wasn't test knitting, I would have been fine just going ahead with my like swatch if I liked the fabric, and then just done a different size. But because I'm test knitting for a specific size, then I've got to get the gauge and then I've got to give feedback on the um, yardages and the fit and the measurement. So I have to do everything by the book, which is fine. Same for the cabled vest, actually. There's a couple of things that I would have done differently if I was just doing the pattern for myself. For example, the main one being I would have mirrored the cables 
because they're not that I think they all twist to the left or something and I would have done you know those ones go to the left and those ones go to the right or something like that but uh, I'm doing it as the pattern designer said to do it and I'm thinking that it's a vest a cabled vest I could see myself do again for sure maybe a different size for a different fit but definitely a different color maybe something in a neutral color because my one is quite blue I guess even though I said it was denim blue it's quite blue so maybe something that's just gray or uh, beige or brown so um, always better I guess to do light colors as opposed to dark so that the cables don't get lost but I've seen some gorgeous vests or sweaters made in black cables which is it's crazy I don't know why but it's it's nice so I think that's it for my works in progress there were three there was a lento the cabled vest and the primrose vest and yeah I'm excited to get the vests done the primrose the deadline is sooner it's in March so that's the one that needs my attention the fastest, I guess. But then I'd like to get the cabled one done anyway, even though it's in July, so that I free up the needles for other things. Uh, the next section I will do then is going to be full start. Like I said at the beginning of the episode, it's something that I want to talk about, just in case, you know, you watch those episodes and you think, oh, everything always turns out so great, and or maybe you don't think that, but, you know, everything always turns out as she had hoped first try but then that's not true there's so many false starts so I thought I'd show you what's on my needles currently that isn't gonna stay on the needles for long uh, I'll start with this I shared it on my story the other day and those are the nutmeg socks uh, I can't remember the name of the designer but I'll put it on the screen it's a free pattern and I had bought the yarn for it this is West Yorkshire Spinner signature four ply in the colorway nutmeg and this is what the pattern actually calls for and this is the sock pattern and those aren't actually cables they're like faux cables uh, and you do them with ribbing and then you just do them on the stockinette and they're just such a pain to do like they look amazing I love this look this is on two millimeter needles but it's such a pain and the needles aren't that pointy and the way that you make those faux cables is by doing some sort of knit three together uh, a variation of that and it's really hard to do and you have to do them almost I think every four row and every four rounds like every four stitch and then every four rounds so there's a lot of them that took ages to do and I know myself I already find it hard to make socks and to make pairs I think there's no way I'm gonna make two of those like I'm still a long way to go to even go for the heel and then doing the foot so I think I'm gonna give up because there's so many other socks I want to do and if I'm not feeling it and I'm not motivated and I hate this, like if I hate the process of it, I'm never going to want to pick this up and I also want to free up the needles and I don't want to put this on hold for too long because then I know it's even less likely that I'll come back to it and it'll feel like an obligation. So I think I will frog this. The yarn I can use as a contrast color for some more of those like self-striping uh, colorways from West Yorkshire Spinner Signature 4 Ply. This is their like mallard colorway by the way and juniper. I don't know if I mentioned but I mentioned it in the previous podcasts. So yeah I love the look of it. I don't love the work involved. I don't know if it's worth for me to continue and it was a free pattern so really just no hard feelings if I don't ever do it again and maybe I'll just get some pointier lace needles at some point and pick it back up again. Who knows? While we're on the topic of socks, like I said before, the extra kind of marzipan that I had in my stash was saved for some socks. And when I got reminded of that, I wanted to cast on those socks. So they're the Erika socks from the week, from the book 52 Weeks of Sock from Lina. And yeah, it's a lace pattern. So I'll show you here what I've got. And I just casted this on and did that for a few like for an hour or so this is what I have so we've got the ribbing and we've got the lace pattern and it's a leaf so it's a leaf pattern surrounded by two little like cable things it's not much for now and um, and it's just like stuck in it here at the back but I've made a mistake in the leaf pattern basically which is the reason why I'm gonna frog this so there's like that hole here where my thumb is is too big I must have messed something up with the yarn overs and also this is on 2.25 and I can already tell it's going to be too large I think I'll just be more comfortable with a two millimeter needle 
I think it's a 56, no, it's a 64 stitch sock, so it's just gonna be too big for me. The lace is very stretchy, and the la the latest lace socks I had done were on two millimeter, and they fit really nicely. So I just wanted to show you that I did all of that, realized I made a mistake, I cannot, for the life of me, go down and ladder and fix that yarn over, never gonna happen. And because it's at the very top of the foot, I think it's gonna be quite eye-catching if there's a big hole in it. I really wouldn't feel comfortable just going ahead and continuing. And then there's a size issue. So that's gonna be frogged for sure. Like literally today, I just wanted to show you. And I just, I probably will restart them over today because I was getting really, I was getting into it and the lace pattern is not too, too hard to follow. You get one chart for the leaf and then two different charts for the cables like next to it. Um, and you have to put it all together in your head by yourself. Some people have done their own chart where, where they brought everything up together. But I think I don't need to do that. I just need to focus. But yeah, that's disappointing. And then while we're on socks, there's another failed sock problem. Uh, and that one is because I really want to make color work socks, but I have never made it before. And it's just not working out. So this is way too big. And it looks quite nice. Uh, this is the Feeling Fruity Socks by Charlotte Stone and I'm using Drops Fable and it's got bubbles! So this was my first time trying bubbles, I think it's quite nice. It's such a slog though, it takes so long to make a bubble but there's not that many rows that have them. I think in total there's only like six bubbles per raspberry, so it's fine. And I think it, it looks fine, the color work is okay as you can see but this is on 2.5 millimeter, and also the way that Charlotte has you do the color work is that you cast on a certain amount of stitches for the rib, but then you add, like you increase stitches to have more for the color work section, then it has you decrease stitches when you're not doing color work, and you're doing that on 2.5, and she also has you change to like, basically 2.5 for the color work, and then 2.25 for the non-color work or something like that. So she has you basically do that to ensure that your floats aren't too tight and that you can pass the sock over to your foot. But I feel like I'm already a loose knitter and my color work is already fine and loose enough without me having to go up a needle size and to increase eight stitches. I think it was just way overkill. But now I know that. I didn't know that at the time, but now I know. So I'm going to frog this again and probably do them on 225 and not increase. I think that could do that. Or do it on two millimeters and increase. I don't know. This probably is gonna be a lot of trial and error, which is not fun. Especially because the bubbles are so early in the foot, I guess you have to do them before you realize whether it's too big or not. But I'll see, I'll keep you updated if I continue, but I might do other socks first if I get frustrated. But this was just to share that socks and me are not best friends. And then speaking of color work, there's another problem as well here. So I showed this in the very first episode in acquisitions and also in my 10 sweaters I want to make. So this is Cascade 220 non-superwash in natural and Vashon Island heather. And it's to make the loom sweater by Sari Nordland, which is a gorgeous, gorgeous sweater that I really want to make. I have for, for ages and I, I love the pattern. I love the colors as well, it's like black and white kind of. This is what I've got so far. So I've made the neck. She has you do the neck like long and then at the very end you sew it together. But I just did my method that I was talking about where I make the double folded color and sew it together. Like I knit it together with the cast on edge already. And then there's the color work. And uh, I gauge swatched in the round in color work. And I already went down a few needle sizes. And Sari also has you increase your needle size when you're doing color work. But again, I think for me, that's just overkill and it doesn't work. And it's way too loose because I, I carry my floats very, very loosely. And this is a thick yarn. So you don't want to have too loose stitches because then it just looks so bulky. Like some of the Vs I already find I'm not happy with because they're, they just look like Vs too much. I'd rather they were like hidden a bit more. But anyway, so I calculated what I had with my gauge and I realized if I wanted the ease that I wanted, I had to do size two instead of size three because of my gauge. So I casted on the neck for size two and then 
continued with like the normal needle size, not the color work needle size, just like what the stockinette is gonna be in for the color work. And then I measured my gauge again once I had this and I realized that this is gonna be too small. And I've actually tried this on and the neck fits really nicely. And I actually do like how the color work is, is laying and I like the fabric it's giving me. If I go down another needle size, I think it's gonna be way too dense and too tight. So what I think I'm gonna do and I was, I guess, maybe wanting your opinions before I, I actually frog and, and do that. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to frog up to the neck. Keep the neck. Because it was, like, hard work. Although, that was not that long, actually. And maybe it would be worth starting everything over. But I could keep the neck that I made for size 2. And then do one row of black where I'm increasing uh, to get the, the stitch count for size 3. And then I could do the yoke in size 3, even though I've got the neck of size 2. I think that would be the best solution. And then me increasing the stitch count for size 3 would give me a nice amount of ease. The same as if I did the correct needle size. Yeah, anyway. So I think I need to do that. I need to increase the stitch count. Because I don't want to increase the needle size. Or decrease the needle size. I'm happy with the needle size I'm doing this on. Which is, by the way, 4 millimeters. I think the pattern has you do your color work on five millimeters. So yeah, it's been a while actually since I did this, so I can't remember exactly like the specifics of the problem, but I just remembered it's not gonna work if I continue. But I really like it. I can't wait to do more. I really, really wanna do this. It's also quite addictive as well, like the chart. Um, it's a circular yoke, so the increases are quite invisible and hidden in the color work, which is really nice. I also, added a pearl row in the color. I don't know if you can see like the little pearl ridges at the top, which is something that Petite Knit does a lot. And I just thought I'd add that flare to the loom sweater. So that's the project that I'm the most excited about and the one that I want to work on, but I knew I had to get stuff off my needles first and that I needed to commit to a decision regarding stitch count and gauge. Like I said before, I wish that I could make sweaters with neat color work like I do my like Fair Isle accessories with Shetland wool. I think this is great color work, if I do say so myself. And I think this is not great color work. And I'm struggling with needle sizes. Whereas this is like really easy now for me. But yeah, so those were all my false starts and things that I'm gonna probably frog soon. But I can see that I've already been speaking for an hour. So I think we're gonna uh, start to wrap things up. There's a last thing that I wanna talk about and I will call this section the Monday sweater saga, I guess. So in the last few episodes I've talked about how I want to make the Monday sweater by Petite Knit with hand-dyed Suri Alpaca. I bought it from Zekami, a local dyer, and I showed it before how it came in the hank, and I showed it what it looked like on the website, and some people said that they agreed with me that it didn't look the same. But then the other day, I think after filming, I decided to kick it up to see what it would look like in the cake. And I was quite surprised to see how m more like how tamer it was. I think it's showing up still a bit too bright, but in real life, this was more beige. This is more beige than what it looks like on the hank. I guess this looks pretty similar. I remember being so shocked. I was like, there's barely any, any yellow or orange. I was quite sad at how orange and yellow the skines looked, or not sad, but like surprised. But when they're caked up, the yellow actually looks more golden. And I like that. It looks very luxurious. It's just very deep and interesting. And I remember then making a note and that I would show you the cake and, you know, the caveat that things actually might look even different in the cake and then they might look different in the swatching. So I swatched, which took a long time, and I swatched using seven colors, I think. So I'll show you that right now. And you can tell me what swatch you prefer and then I'll uh, take that in consideration and pick my favorite and then maybe cast it on soon. Well, actually I need to buy yarn for it because I want to buy a luxurious yarn that has cashmere in it just to make that sweater like the best sweater I've ever made. So I swatched with stuff I had in stash just for like the color idea. This is gonna be a real pain to show because it's still attached to all the yarns but I'll definitely show some b-roll of this. And as you can see, it's still attached to everything else. But yeah. So I started with green here at the bottom. 
a light pistachio green. Then I went with a gray and then some kind of off-white and then white here. And then an off-white that's more like beige, like almondy, creamy. And then a light beige and then a dark beige. So I've actually I've actually made a fade and I love this. I think this is so fun and, and beautiful. It's making me really, really happy and excited. It's also the softest thing ever. Surrey Alpaca is just a different game than mohair in my opinion but yeah I'll try and put it up like that I hope you can see this the different colors there are definitely seven so the white is in the middle so there's three under white and three above white but let me know what you think I'll try and put some b-roll before or after or during this um, to maybe show it better but can you please let me know I guess for ease we could say that this is um, the green is number one and then the gray is two, and this is three, white is four, this is five, six, and beige is seven. Just in case you want to reference that, or if you want to tell me like, oh, the white or the off-white. But yeah, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What color should I pick for a Monday sweater by Petite Net? I think this showed me that they all had their value and they all look good. Even a fade would be so great. Like, this is so pretty. I'm almost feeling bad I've got to undo the swatch because like it's just I want to keep the colors but yeah I think the they all have their value and, and their pros and cons like at first I didn't think I was going to like the white the pure white but I kind of like it actually uh, and the green is definitely something that a lot of you suggested in the comments of my previous video and I agree the green is great the beige I wasn't even sure I was going to swatch with but someone suggested I do and it actually worked quite well and then the off-whites were kind of like an obvious choice. There's a the, the gray as well, the light gray. I wasn't sure I would like that, but it looks great as well. So anyway, I'll stop showing this. But let me know what you think and which yarn I should pair it with. I'm excited to, to do it, but I'm really taking my time with this. I want this to be a very mindful, considered project that I will keep for, for forever. And I don't want to rush a decision and then not be happy with it. Because normally in this section I would talk about acquisitions, but like I said, it's, it's already getting to a long video and those are a bit harder to edit and export. So I'll wrap things up, but I'll put some footage of the new yarn that I got. Uh, I guess as a bit of a life update. My parents came to visit recently in Scotland, which was really nice. They came to visit at the end of January and they hadn't gifted me anything for Christmas yet and I had told them that what I would like was yarn so we bought some things together and they said that that was my gift so I'm really really grateful to them I was able to purchase some yarn that I had my sights on for so long that maybe felt a little bit more you know luxurious or special that I didn't necessarily want to get myself so I'll show some footage of that yarn and I'll also tell you what I'm planning to make with it. So the Gilead, that's going to be a season sweater by Ozetta. Not the oversized, I think just the season sweater. Uh, the original one has some mohair, but some people have done it with Gilead and it looks amazing. It's a woolen spun as well, so it should be light. Then the Loch Lomond is going to be for the Harlow sweater by Kadri. I think, or the Harlow sweater v-neck, I'm not sure yet, but I think I'll make the original one with a high neck. Then the Fiberco Ciro, the very light blue here, that's going to be a fingering weight sweater from Irene Lynn, and I can't remember the name of it, but I'm currently writing up and planning the video that I will make on 10 fingering weight sweaters that I want to do, so you'll definitely see that yarn making an appearance there. I'm going to try and maybe swatch for that so that I can show them in that video, so stay tuned. And then same for that uh, moss color, that's Biobalance. And it's also going to be a fingering weight sweater that I will talk about later. So I'm not going to talk about that too much right now. And the other wool here is a Studio, Do Studio Donegal Soft Donegal in like that gray thing. And that's for Highland Sleepover, also by Ozetta. And it's in the original colorway that she also has in that gray. And I think it's so gorgeous and beautiful. 
but it does use a lot of yarn like more than I thought I had to buy I had to get five skeins um but I'm excited to make it I don't know if I'll make it now I think maybe the season has passed a little bit but it could be nice a nice autumn slash beginning of winter for next year but it's just gorgeous to look at and I'm excited to use a uh, studio Donegal because I haven't yet so thank you so much to mom and dad for that wonderful Christmas gift. I had gifted them some knitted items before and when they came to visit that time they were wearing them which was again making my little knitter's heart so happy. And I gifted my mom the Cargill cowl, she loved it. I also gave her my no frills sweater that I talked about before that I don't wear and she was so happy to have it. It kept her warm in the Scottish uh, winter when she was visiting and I gave my dad the hipster hat that I made in blue to replace another hat that I had made him ages ago in acrylic so and also I think it will fit him better because it can be rolled up at the edges to fit his head so they were really happy with that so it was nice and wholesome to have my parents visit and you know I told them about the YouTube channel and everything and you know they've been really supportive which is nice the other yarn that I bought this month was the Along Avec Anna yarn for the test knit and then I bought some Jameson's uh, wool for a very special project that I will talk about in my next video which I think hopefully will be next week and will be my knitting goals and intentions for this year which I know it's February, I'm late but I really want to make it and uh, make myself like accountable and feedback in a year whether those goals were met so I'm hopefully going to be showing that yarn in that video. So if you want to see that, then please subscribe to the channel. And also if you like this content, then like it or comment. Like I said, you can always message me on Instagram or, or comment and we can chat. I always try and reply to all the comments. It's one of my favorite parts is, is reading everyone's input and opinions and advice. It's, it's so, so great to have a bit of a back and forth as opposed to it feeling just like me speaking to my camera in my room. But yeah, it was really nice and exciting to talk to you all today and update you on all that project. Like I said, if you want to please let me know what's like, what, what color I should hold with the Zakami um, based on that swatch that I showed you. And also if you want to ask questions in the comments that I can answer in the next episode in a little Q&A, that would be really nice. Now the moment that we've all been waiting for, I will announce the giveaway winner and I will film that on Monday, today's Saturday. So I don't have the winners yet, but I will insert a little video here when I'm editing. But until then, I'll see you all in the next video. Thank you so much for watching this and yeah, happy knitting. Bye. Okay, everyone. So it's Monday after 12. So I'm going to pick the giveaway winner. There were just shy of 200 entries. So good luck. Yay! So the winner is Emmy Knits and Pearls uh, for the comments. I've been watching the last few of your podcasts and I'm really enjoying. Looking forward to watching the next. So yeah, Emmy, you win. Uh, to avoid any kind of scam or anything, I'm not um, going to get in touch with you. So if you're watching this, please get in touch with me, either on YouTube or Instagram or email or Ravelry. All the links are in the description. So I hope that you see this and if I don't hear from you then we'll see. But yeah, you win and uh, well done everyone else for participating. There will definitely be future giveaways in the future so stay tuned. Bye everyone!